Hey everyone, welcome back to the DGA YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about architectures, and that is architectures for decentralized games, as you would probably guess by the channel and the title. This is only an introduction, so I can only go so deep into the technology. I can't tell you every single detail, as you can imagine, but at least I can give you something to start from, and this will help you with the learning process. In a previous video, I talked about how to build decentralized games. Of course, that was also only an overview. Things were at a very high level. And in the video, I was talking about approaches. Now here, I'm going to be talking about architectures. And in many ways, the two are really just the same. I'm using a slightly different word. Maybe I have a slightly different meaning. So what did I say in the previous video when I was talking about how to build? When I was talking about approaches, I, I described your approach as either going to be on-chain, where all of your game logic is on-chain, or off-chain, where pretty much all of your game logic or all of your game logic is off-chain, which means all of the computation, all of the execution of the logic is done on a player's computer or done somewhere else, maybe in the cloud, but not on-chain, on the actual blockchain. So I've called, I called those approaches. And here, when I'm talking about architectures, I'm going to be talking a bit more about tech stacks and the various layers of the tech stack rather than saying, you know, which approach is best or whatever. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of how I've split these up. It's a little bit arbitrary, but bear with me. So under architectures, I've got three architectures. Monolithic, where you pretty much do everything on chain in a monolith. You have a layered approach where you have most of the computation on, uh, sorry, you have most of the computation off chain, or potentially you do a little bit of a mix between some on chain and some off chain. Uh, and then lastly, I've, I've called something hybrid architecture. I'm not entirely happy with that naming. I sort of wonder if I need a new name or if I potentially even need to split that into something else. I've got, in, in the book that I was writing, which I've mentioned in a previous video, I said that there is a hybrid architecture and an advanced hybrid architecture in the book. Anyway, the point being is that most of the computation, again, is off-chain. You can, you can do a mix of on and off-chain, and potentially you have a centralized component to the computation. Now, in the advanced hybrid architecture, I'm suggesting that you can actually decentralize that centralized component, but it's off-chain. And you'll see what I mean when I go through the slides. It's, it is quite a bit more advanced, but also quite interesting. And if I was to gamble, that would be the way to go for, for complex projects in the future. Let's start off. So monolithic. Here on the left side, you can see this picture that I've pulled from the, the book. I have a tech stack, a very, very simple tech stack. I'm missing a lot of details, of course. But the idea is you have a blockchain, surprise, surprise. And then you have the game client, which is the user interface. On the right side of your screen, you can see I have this picture of Nine Chronicles, the game. That's the user interface, that's what people click. And then underneath that is the blockchain where... Now, in some games, the logic of the, of the, of the game is on the blockchain. For Nine Chronicles, actually, I, I might not be correct here because Nine Chronicles is based upon a random number. The random number comes from the chain, but the computation of what happens is technically off-chain on the player's computer. It's a very simple calculation essentially to say whether the player won the combat or not. So there's a little bit of the... There's a little bit here that I actually don't quite know myself in terms of how much of the computation is on and how much is off for Nine Chronicles. I probably should, but I never dug that deeply. But I think in this example you can see how a monolithic architecture works in theory. You can at least appreciate that the game logic could be all on-chain and it can be very simple and then you just render the result off-chain on the player's computer. 
And so that's where I'm saying that you typically have a thick blockchain where it's thick in terms of that's where the logic is. A lot of it is there. That's the most of the competition. And then the game client is quite thin. It just reads the data and then shows, hey, look, you, you won combat. Examples of this are Huntercoin, the very first decentralized game. Eterno, which I also mentioned in a previous video. It's no longer running, um, but the game logic was in a smart contract running on, I think, running on XDAI. Let me push on. This is simple and interesting, but this is just the start of the journey. This is probably a good place to start if you're new, is trying to do it in this way. Or at least doing like the random number way, where you have a random number that you have in a block cache, but then you actually push most of the computation off chain. And let's take a little bit look at what I've called a layered architecture. Here, if we if we draw a reference specifically to Zaya's technology, so they're building a game called Torion, and uh, they have one called Zaya's Ships, which actually uses state channels, but it's kind of the same thing here. The, the architecture is very similar, actually. In their technology stack, the blockchain is only used for storing data, and so it provides data availability. And as you can see at the bottom of either diagram, this is meant to be my blockchain network, and data flows between player computers and the blockchain to store the data. The processing of the data actually happens on the player's computers. And this is where I'm trying to show you in this diagram on the right side, the players do the bulk of the computation to check the logic of the game on their computer. So they read the data. They don't know if the data is right at that point. They've just said, okay, this sits on the chain. And then on their computer, they do the computation to say, okay, was this data valid? So if a, as a classic example that I've used in previous videos, if a player tries to move 15 squares, but they're only allowed to move 10 squares, then that move would not be valid. And so it would be disregarded by the players. And if every single player who's working from the same set of rules can agree upon the data being valid or not, then obviously you don't break anything to do with decentralization and you don't break anything to do with consensus either. And that's one of the big breakthroughs that Zaya had with their architecture. It's actually the colored coins approach. So it's not in, in, entirely new. Um, this is like an obvious iteration up from where the team were with, with Hunter Coin. And obviously in this case, the bulk of the game logic is off chain. It's sitting on the player computers and it's assumed, at least in the original architecture of, of for Torion, that all players would run a full node and that all players would run this game state processor, which is a sort of middle layer that, that Zaya have created. And then of course the user interface is, is in this case, you know, here, this is Torion and there isn't much done in the game interface in terms of processing, which is probably, tr I think, true all, all, um, all the time. The idea here on the left side, when I'm trying to draw this picture, I've got a user interface and a game client all together. Um, I didn't mention that the GSP sits inside the game client. Um, the Zaya team would need to correct me here, but I think this is packaged to together as a single binary, which is why the line for the game client encloses the interface uh, and obviously the, the game state processor, which processes all the moves and says if they're valid or not. So this is a pretty nice approach. It obviously gets you into a place which I think is much more scalable than building a monolithic architecture. There's pros and cons, I think, of both, but this at least makes sense to me. Okay, here is an interesting one. So this is me getting into the hybrid architectures and you have a combination of something which is decentralized and something which is centralized. The most obvious example of this is Axie Infinity. It's obviously the most popular game right now for a blockchain game and I think pretty much every blockchain game does this. So what you have is you have a blockchain, probably Ethereum, you have smart contracts there uh, which is mostly for NFTs so just for game assets. But in this case, the game logic is actually processed on a developer server. And so the data is obviously read to the developer server and there's some data flow between the player, the player's device, the developer server and the blockchain. And of course, the player's device will render how the game looks. 
and and so that's if I understand it correct here, and I'm not the expert here in XA, is that the player's device doesn't really do a lot other than displaying the user interface. In this architecture diagram, I've probably made part of it too fat, but let's not worry about that. It is what it is. Obviously, this is probably a gross oversimplification of, of what happens, but I do believe that the player device is fairly simple in this case and that the bulk of the actual processing of the game logic is done on a developer server. Okay, so now if you imagine that, that developer server was decentralized somehow, such that players, so the community, decided to actually run these servers themselves in the cloud, whether it's DigitalOcean or AWS or G Cloud or on their own actual box in some, you know, data warehouse, you know, that's 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 the idea, is to, is to get it away from a developer owned and run um, box and to for community run boxes. So at the bottom you still have the blockchain. So in the case of, of Torion from Zaya, it's the da- the blockchain's there for data availability. And so the the it still does its own thing. These these of course these computers, these nodes can be run anywhere, whether it's on a player's computer or it can be run in the cloud somewhere or or whatever. The separate layer here is kind of similar, so it's itself is not a blockchain, but it is decentralized computation. They're all replicated, they're all following the same rules, and so they're all processing the same data that they take from the blockchain. And it's here where the game logic is processed. Except, as I've, as I've said, this is community-owned and community-run, rather than developer-owned and developer-run. And so... This is a, a new thing that the Zaya team have worked on is that their game state processors now sit, or they can sit, I should say, in this other layer, which can be in the cloud and is not run by the developer. You still have players on their desktops, or you can have, so a player on their desktop can still run a full node if they choose to, of course, and they can run their own game state processor on their desktop. So they, they have the option because they're running a high-powered device. However, for players that don't want to be using the desktop, they can use a mobile, and you could have a mobile running off one of these boxes in the cloud, or maybe you could have like 50 mobiles running off a single um, cloud-hosted game state processor. So that is obviously an interesting sort of leap forward where you don't necessarily have to be running a desktop you can have a low powered device and the benefits here is that you don't have to rely upon a centralized developer server. Now, of course, a developer probably will own at least one box within this cloud, perhaps even several. The idea here is not that you have to remove the developer completely and utterly, but rather it's the idea is to reduce the reliance on them and hence why it's decentralized and a decentralized game. As before, the user interface, which is this picture here that I have of Torion, is basically the same, so it's, it's, it's pretty simple. And in theory, you could also play it on a mobile, as I've said. Now, should this be called a hybrid architecture? I don't know, maybe there's a better name for it. In the book, I've called it an advanced hybrid architecture. It's not really hybrid in the sense that there's no centralization, so it's not really a, a hybrid of decentralization and no, no, it's not a hybrid of decentralization and centralization. There's probably a better word for it. Um, comments below, I guess, or come and comment in, in, in Discord. So that's everything I wanted to say in my introduction to architectures. I think it was quite brief. Um, it's obviously simplified and I, I only give so much. I think in a later video, it would be nice to dig into more details of the architectures. Now that this last slide has come up, it's worth pointing out that we have had talks from the Zaya team, which I'm circling now, and we've also had talks from the Planetarium team who have worked on Nine Chronicles. In both of these videos, the two teams... Oh, there's the Thernal as well. In each of these three videos here that I'm highlighting, the developers talk a little bit about their tech there and a little bit about their tech stack and so the architectures. 
I know Zaya for sure definitely go into it and it, this could be one that's worth checking out later if you're thinking of you know where to go next. Also the book that I mentioned that I'm working on it's an open source book it's on GitHub. I do have more details here on the architecture plus a whole bunch of links that will take you to other places like to the Zaya repos or or whatever. This is obviously just a starting point. I can't cover everything. I'm not even like you know the expert the same way that the developers are but I, I obviously know enough that I can give you a short video on it. I would welcome you to come to our discord that's where most of the action happens that's where most of the conversation is we have a twitter I think we're now about 150 subscribers something like this. We have a website I know it's not great I see that in every video so you know have a look but I know it could be better. Uh, and then obviously here on YouTube, you, you're already here. So if you wanted to like the video and subscribe to us, that would be great. That would be appreciated. It would help the channel to grow. And I think it would probably help with the YouTube algorithm in order to get our message to go wider. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say. And of course, lastly, is to remind you that the links will be in the description for the video. Thank you very much.